Hi, everyone. Welcome to Trader Chats, unique perspectives from seasoned traders. I'm your host, Imran Laka, founder of Options Insight and 20-year professional options trader. As you might know, I became a trading mentor about three years ago, but I thought these conversations would be a great way for my students to gain valuable perspectives from some of the professional traders that I know and respect. I hope you enjoy the episode. Welcome back to Trader Chats, everyone. I'm Imran Laka from Options Insight. And today I've got Shrenik Shah here with me. He's a macro portfolio manager, runs a team of people, has been you know, in the game for a long time. And today's discussion we're going to call heavyweight macro trading. Welcome, mate. Good to see you. Hey, Imran. Uh, it's been a while. We've been trying to get this on all year, right? I know. It's good to finally have you here. Yeah, pleasure. So trenick has been a good friend of mine for a number of years. We, we know each other from university. Um, I would say our careers kind of started on a similar path. We both entered it in the world of banking in equities, uh, and now we're in very different places, I would say. Uh, but why don't you, why don't we hear it from the horse's mouth? Why don't you tell us a little bit about how you got into uh, macro portfolio management? Yeah, sure. Um, so, I mean, it's a pretty long story, so we'll take it. We'll, we'll, we'll take it from we'll have the, the short top. version. So, yeah, <laughs> yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll have the short version. Um, uh, so I've lived in, lived in London all my life. I had a pretty uh, ordinary kind of upbringing. My first recollection of kind of financial markets was, I think, just in in on the morning news. Like there used to be stats on like FX, you know, sterling sterling dollar rates every day and the FTSE, etc. So there was a little bit of a fascination with that. Um, I remember in year nine, so year eight, so I was probably around 12, I did a, an, an IT project uh, and I chose some kind of stock trading uh, and it was completely free form and no, there was no kind of leading um, from the teacher or anything. And I, and I chose a mechanism for trying to make money on stocks. And I look back at it now and it had stock losses and it had kind of buy signals and sell signals. So it was a bit of a kind of early days, systematic um, trading mm. strategy. So that was pretty cool. Mm. Um, and then, you know, finance as a, as a career, I think started for me, I shadowed um, one of my relatives when I was probably 13, 14. He worked in finance. I think it was a relationship manager. And to be honest, the, uh, lifestyle, the kind of material, the status, that was where um, the, the seed was probably sown. Mm -hmm. And from that point on, kind of all the academic choices and the career choices, et cetera, um, were leading, I think, kind of looking back with hindsight one way, right? So yeah. um, we ended up, you know, at, at the LSE together uh, mm -hmm. after, after doing A-levels and it was, um, again, you know, the, the vibe at that, at that time, at that university, uh, people were just honed to get into to finance. And I think I was no different. Um, mm. So, yeah, started uh, first job um, at Deutsche uh, on the trading floor. Uh, and this was in 2002. So back then, um, Deutsche was a pretty strong powerhouse in terms of trading and investment banking. It was a great, great place to start. Lots of risk appetite were given um, positions and books to run very, very early on. And it was a great training ground, uh, particularly for kind of concepts of risk and probabilities and trading. Like I kind of think about trading versus investing. Maybe the differentiation is clearly on time horizon where trading, you kind of operate on shorter time horizons, but also on the level of predictability of the outcomes, you're operating on low predictable outcomes when you're trading when you're investing you do that more analysis you start to step up to slightly higher levels of predictability and then different techniques to kind of deal with those different 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 kind of pockets or exploitations in markets anyway so yeah um 
uh, did a stint at Deutsche um, and then moved to Credit Suisse in a, in a, in a similar role um, and uh, spent a couple of years there. And 2009, post the GFC, it was a pretty grueling time. And I, I'm sure you can kind of <laughs> sympathize with that. I will never forget, I think. Yeah. It? Yeah. Yeah. That was, that, that was, that was pretty, pretty hard, hard day. So 2009, uh, I kind of stopped myself out, took, took a bit of time out. Um, and I think that was really, really, um, a really pivotal point in my, in my career. Because just to kind of te- take that step out from this treadmill that I kind of maybe jumped on very early on and kind of just went all the way through, take a bit of time to reflect and think about, hey, what do I really want to do? What do I really want to get out of my job? Um, that was, um, I think, a really important point in my career. And funnily mm-hmm. enough, I um, got back into markets, I think about a year, a year and a half later, um, through your help. Um, yeah. one of got, my clients yeah that's right yeah yeah it was a, it was a bit of a funny story so anyway um was back in markets and i'm at the same place uh that i was in that i joined in 2010 and now running a team and running a business and um really enjoying what we're doing that's the main thing that's why i do what i do now right you went when you're in your 40s and you've been in this game for 20 years you got to find a job you enjoy. It's not, you know, like you, like you kind of alluded to before, we started off in our 20s, it was all about the money. Where can I make money? Where can I set up a good life for myself? We, we were motivated with that. And that's what all the kids going into finance back then were after. But then you get to the point where you're in your sort of mid 30s, 40s, whatever it is. And you're like, actually, it's about doing something. I, I want to be excited when I wake up in the morning about going to work and I want to enjoy what I do. So, you know, I think it's great that you're doing that now and I'm certainly doing that now too as well. Um, But let's move a bit on now to the macro discussion then, just what everyone's probably listening in for. Um, So yeah, seeing as you know, I've called it heavyweight macro because clearly you're not trading small size over there, right? So you're, you're, you're running macro from the perspective of real money, proper money, and so I think it would be quite informative to the audience to get a real understanding of how you look at the world and how you think about constructing a portfolio, right? And a lot of this listeners will be running their own pension funds and things like that and just managing their own money. Um, but having this insight from you, I think, will be particularly useful, right? Um, a lot of the guys out there in the macro space focus on two main things in terms of uh to figure out what regime we're in and then that guides their asset allocation right so people look at inflation they look at growth and they try to get a feel for where those two things are headed to to decide what type of sectors to be in uh and and what the risks are and whether equities are likely to perform well or commodities etc cetera, etc cetera. so is that a framework that you include into what you guys look at um and how, and are there other factors that, that you think other people should also include? Yeah, um, great question. Maybe if I just take a step back, right? So um, you mentioned macro investing several times. And I think, um, at least from my perspective and my vantage point, that notion of macro investing, it's a pretty heterogeneous uh, landscape. So there are many different ways that people invest. So kind of with that caveat, um, I think, Personally, there are three areas in markets where there are inefficiencies that I feel that, you know, personally are pretty good uh, areas to try to exploit. And again, different areas require different skill sets, and that's a completely different discussion. But so let's just, and these are kind of separated on the axis of, let's say, time and kind of intrinsic predictability. We just touched on that a little bit earlier. So um, at the very shortest time frame, you know, in the kind of trading style, if you have, uh, it's a very uh, unpredictable environment. So you need to have some edge. It could be kind of over an event where you've done the analysis on the event, or it could be on technicals. So understanding positioning or flows. And there's quite a lot of statistical um, nuance and probabilities that are involved in trading or investing to generate alpha from the inefficiencies on the shortest time frame. So that's one area that I think is, um, completely um, um, a, an acceptable, acceptable area to generate returns. Mm-hmm. Then you've got the shorter to medium term um, time frame, And this has slightly higher degrees of predictability. And why? Because 
in that time zone or that time horizon, um, there appears to be some kind of cyclical phenomena that are influencing um, asset prices. And so what, what the, would you what do you call the short to medium term? We're talking six, three to six months. Yeah, I'm kind of being quite specifically vague because it's difficult to put time frames on these. So you know, if you think about these drivers, they're typically macro and they're kind of along the lines that you described, right? So they're growth drivers, they're uh, inflation drivers, and there are sentiment drivers and liquidity drivers, and those as a collection, sometimes one component. Uh, stronger than others mm. are quite strong drivers of various asset classes in financial markets. So take, for example, growth, right? So economic growth, that clearly impacts real interest rates. So that's going to influence bond prices. It's going to impact the differentials in growth, it's going to impact real yield differentials. So they're going to impact FX markets. Growth is going to impact equities through a couple of channels. So the first channel is the more growth you have, the more revenues of uh, a any company potentially generates and you know influences the stock price. The more growth you have, the underlying environment is stronger, less left tail risk, and you have a cost of equity compression, which is a driver of valuation. So you've got an earnings impulse and a valuation impulse that comes from, from growth. Anyway, so mm-hmm. you've got these various components, growth, inflation, sentiment, and liquidity that drive asset prices over that shorter to medium term. We can discuss that a little bit more in in a moment. And then the third area of inefficiency, there are many areas of inefficiency, but this is kind of what I think works and what we've focused on over over the years, Um, is that kind of more three plus year time horizon. It's in the equity asset class. It's that um, where, where you've got the notion of earnings power being the ultimate driver of a given equity security Mm. and understanding that through the lens of doing the work on the addressable market on the management on the barriers of entry on the moats etc and that is the highest or the higher end of the predictability scale and um so we started out with that trading style where it's a 50 50 bet unless you got some edge and you go into that very longer much more longer term where you do the work and you can rest uh, a little bit easy on the analysis that you do and the valuation that you get in. Um, but there are many areas that you could exploit kind of from a macro macro perspective. And then ha- so but what do you think the right mix is then of allocation towards those different time horizons? So if I'm if I'm running my own portfolio as a PA investor, because there's more predictability in that long-term thematic type investing that you're saying, would you would you say you know you park seventy percent of your capital in that type of stuff? I don't know if that's the right number, but do you know what I mean? Is it a case of you definitely push the book towards being more heavily allocated in those type of things and much smaller in the more tactical stuff? Yeah, I mean, you know, I think there's a place for each of those components in a well-rounded um, macro portfolio. So clearly, you want to have. So so that longer term component is where you're going to get your real appreciation, where you're going to get your 15, 20% compounding per year over over the long term. Mm -hmm. And the cyclical and the shorter term timeframes, to be frank, they are more difficult to exploit Mm -hmm. um, and potentially potentially not more prone to more prone to error. But as a single investor, I think it's actually quite difficult to span all three credibly. Mm -hmm. Because you need different skill sets, you need a different level of patience for that longer term investing, a different mm-hmm. analytical uh, mindset. Whereas, you know, that kind of trading stroke shorter term mentality, you've got to have that contrarian mindset. You've got to have that relative um, kind of thinking in your in in you know in in your mind when you're thinking about oh, how are other people positioned, how are other people viewing mm-hmm. the cycle. Um, so, some of this stuff as a sole investor, you should outsource. You should find. Yeah find your knitting, find what kind of suits um, and kind of, you know, manage, manage to that. I think that's probably, you know, clearly when you've got a larger team, there are going to be people who are specialized in different components. Mm -hmm. And then you can think about um, the overall portfolio construction um, Mm -hmm. in those terms. Yeah, that makes sense. I mean, I think the good thing nowadays though, is, you know, 
you get lots of people out there providing research, like really high grade research, right? Like the likes of Darius at 42 Macro and that's quant driven asset allocation type stuff that helps the individual investor kind of know where to park their long-term money because he's doing the work for you. Do you know what I mean? And then you could be a guy who does a bit of day trading and that's what you think you're good at and you might use technical indicators and things like that. And, and so what I mean is with your own money, you are doing all those different strategies, but you're outsourcing bits of it to people who you kind of think are good at what they do, basically. Yeah, I mean, I love the way the kind of financial, the, the financial landscape is evolving for mm. um, the individual investor. I mean, it's, it's pretty awesome, right? So Darius, yeah. I, I, I saw your interview was it, uh, a few months back and yeah. that was a pretty awesome interview. So, I mean, yeah, that's, that's all good stuff. Yeah, I'm, I'm chatting to him again next week. But anyway, um, all right, cool. So yeah, you know, similar sort of views and thoughts then um, to kind of how what feeds into the framework. So you mentioned sentiment and liquidity. So can you elaborate a bit how you kind of gauge that stuff? Yeah, sure. So again, so think about that short, shorter to medium term time, time horizon. Think about cycles, um, driving markets and no one cycle is the same as the previous cycle. And that's where we really want to get a collection of different components to understand what's the composition of this cycle. Because mm -hmm. understanding what the composition is at any point in time, like what's driving it? Is it growth? Is it inflation? Is it sentiment? Is it liquidity? Uh, mm -hmm. Has implications on what you should hold. Um, and you can probably refine what you hold to give you better outcomes by understanding the cycle that much better, right? So mm -hmm. it works from that overarching premise that, as you come out of a trough um, in general activity, general macro indicators, the market kind of underestimates the persistence of that positive impulse. Mm -hmm. So you're kind of moving into that recovery stage, you go into expansion and um, you are monetizing that inefficiency of the market underestimating the persistence. Mm -hmm. And then you go to the other, then you get to the peak of the cycle where market has a habit or has historically had a habit of extrapolating the good times um, too enthusiastically, right? And mm -hmm. then you get the turning point um, and then you're going to slow down and then you go into contraction where there's, you know, a bit of fear, where there's a bit of panic, et cetera. So like that's the um, inefficiency in markets and what we, what we trying to kind of think about, you know, and we have done for several years and there's lots of work still to be done is, trying to identify this cycle. So you mentioned growth, inflation, they're widely used components. We use sentiment. Sentiment is an interesting one because it's nothing particularly fancy. These are kind of market-based sentiment indicators and they are uh, also survey-based kind of real world indicators. And what we're trying to do here is capture that endogenous propulsion of the, the trend. So think about volatility as one of those indicators. Mm. As volatility drops, you start to get an increasing level of enthusiasm in markets, mm -hmm. more money coming in, particularly from certain you know, risk parity strategies, for example, and that propels markets in a way. But then you get to a point where vol is really low and it becomes a contrarian indicator and you want to take the other side at a turning point. Mm -hmm. So that's an example of sentiment, right? And then liquidity, I think liquidity, uh, again, think about markets since the global financial crisis, they've been liquidity driven for large periods. And how does that liquidity channel work? So clearly there is that, um, let's just take um, March, 2020 and the liquidity injections that we saw. Mm -hmm. So there is that initial element of just um, providing um, money into the system. And what that does at the very first point from the way we look at things is, it just takes out, again, that left tail risk. So mm. where you've got um, high levels of bankrupt bankruptcy, for example, priced in or distress priced in in equity and bonds, respectively, those assets, sometimes called kind of trashier, junkier assets, mm -hmm. they have that left tail probability cut, cut quite mm -hmm. hard, right? So, so they re-rate re massively, yeah? They re-rate very fast. Mm -hmm. And that's a, that's a very different... So, you know, as soon as you see a cycle that is catalyzed by liquidity, um, those are the kind of assets you want to own initially. You don't really want to own, for example, commodities, where 
um, they are later stage uh, or later cycle assets in, in, in the framework, and they are more likely to be driven from growth rather than liquidity. But here's the kind of core bit, right? Liquidity, um, different components will pass on to different other components through the life of the cycle, right? So mm -hmm. liquidity first, that gives you the environment for confidence to grow and kind of growth to start to pick up. Mm -hmm. Then you start to move into, for example, commodities where um, you've got that demand surety as you, as you build confidence in that growth outlook. Mm -hmm. When you invest in commodities, there are multiple areas you've got to think about, right? You've got to think about the supply side of any given commodity. You've got to think about the technical backdrop, the CTA flow, the systematic flow is a big, big driver of mm -hmm. some of these market moves. There are kind of geopolitical stuff as well. But, you know, as with all of this stuff, these cycles and the kind of tracking of the cycles or uh, understanding the longer term drivers of given stock in that longer term framework, they're only one piece of the puzzle, but they mm -hmm. just help to improve the chances of success. You've got to look at a range of other things too. Mm -hmm. And do you also, and obviously you look cross region as well, right? So do you break it down? Obviously China is a massive driver to things. US is obviously a massive driver. Europe, they're probably the, the th major three ways you break it down, Europe, US, and China, I imagine. Or, or yeah, right? that's, that, that's really interesting. And, and I mean, it's really interesting you said that because kind of, yeah, that, that, I think that's a very sensible way to look at things. Mm. If you think about that, let's say 10, let's say 15, 20 years ago, you may have said Europe, the US and Japan. Yeah. Um, so again, like that's part of our jobs. That's so interesting. And that's the interesting thing about markets is, you know, underlying trends, they're always in flux, always in change. And you've got these winners, you've got these losers. And identifying um, this and changing your approach appropriately to the changing backdrops. China was clearly a lot smaller economy 20 years ago. Mm. And even through the high growth rates back then, it would not have had a massive impact on asset prices. But today, clearly, as we know, um, the stance, the cyclical posture of China is massively influential, not just on Chinese assets, but just mm. on global assets. Um, what, what I find particularly too. interesting about China as well is it's quite out of sync with the rest of the world right now in terms of its cycles, right? It seems like they've been, you know, in this aggressive re regulation, you know, cycle, if you want to call it, and they're just starting to show some signs of easing at the same time when everyone else is tightening, basically, in terms of monetary, right? So it's quite out of out of lockstep with, with the rest of the world, which... I don't know if it, it's always like that. I'm not an expert in China, but it, I, I find it quite interesting, right? And, and you know, for, I'm, I've been trading commodities quite a lot over the last sort of couple of years. And obviously it's a major driver for commodities, right? And so there was this big thing, the China credit impulse that was going to basically lead commodities lower uh, with a lag or whatever. And, and that, that kind of took the wind out of a lot of industrial commodities last year. They, they'd had their rally and they, like copper, for example, just went sideways for the second half of the year, right? And that was partly because of what was happening in China. And now with China potentially easing and people thinking it might be turning. And again, this would probably leads me on to my next question, which is rate of change. You know, when you're trying to pick these cycles in, in these factors that you've discussed, is it the rate of change that's really the most important thing that you need to care about? And that's what's going to drive asset prices? Or, is, or do you also care about the levels? Like, what do you think is more important? Because, you know, Darius definitely thinks it's all about rate of change in terms of how his asset allocation should look. Would you echo that sentiment? Yeah, I mean, I'd love to come back on the China point um, uh, a bit later on. But on the, on the rates of change versus the levels, yeah, I, I, I'd agree. On that, um, you know, if you are laying out um, that um, setup where you've got these inefficiencies and you've got the market uh, underestimating the persistence and overestimating the extrapolation. It's really about the changes. Um, they're going to be most influential. But again, I kind of go back to my point where the, a cycle framework, any cycle framework, any one way to look at you know, the driver and asset class, the asset, the asset class or a security or a sector is just that it's one way, right? So levels will come into it to a certain degree, particularly for longer term investments, in my opinion. 
Uh, mm. Other factors like technicals clearly come into, you know, the analysis of a given security, the value, the value level of valuation, you know, how mm. much is priced in um, also is a kind of key, key determinant, right? So you could have your cyclical um, framework pointing to expansion, but some of these assets could have already rallied, right? So you've yeah, got to yeah. be careful as to how you use these tools to actually make investment decisions. And again, there is no shortcut to doing the work um, to uh, ahead of making um, any any decision. Yeah, I mean, that point about how much is priced in, I mean, that's I'm constantly, that's what you're constantly chasing, right? Because a lot of the time the market front runs the fundamentals, right? So we're all trying to figure out what regime we're in, of growth, inflation, things like that. And then the market front runs it. And then when you get to that regime that you thought was coming, the market's fully discounted it already. <laughs> so there's no, there's no trade to do at that point. You need to be looking at the next play, right? The next regime that you're heading into every time, right? So yeah, yeah completely. Like that, that concept of what's priced in is across the time horizon spectrum, right? So when you're doing your, your day trading or trading over an event, and let's take an FOMC, so a federal market meeting, mm -hmm. and the word in markets narrative is it's going to be hawkish. Mm -hmm. and it is hawkish, but the price action is dovish. It tells you something yeah. about what's priced in, right? Okay. We just talked about what's what's priced in the, in the cyclical time frame, then got to get it right. And then even on that longer term time frame, you can have the best stock in the world with the you know with really strong. Um, earnings power and you know great growth prospects and really high kind of moats and barriers etc but if it's priced in then again it doesn't become a particularly good investment so that's completely crucial to keep an eye on that yeah 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 cool um okay so so like my next question to you would be and this kind of um you know, this ties into a lot of what I do right so obviously our options insight I teach people about options trading uh, and a big part of the reason why people use options is for hedging purposes. So when you're a when you're a heavyweight portfolio manager running yards, as we like to call it, which means billions for those who don't know, um, how do you think about the hedging side and the diversification? Because obviously, hedging costs money, right? Hedging there's a premium associated with buying options, and a lot of people don't like to bleed loads of time decay and, and premium in options, and so. Lots of macro people that I've spoken to prefer to just kind of diversify across asset class, you know, um, and, and using things like gold and, and bonds maybe as their diversifiers that when the world doesn't look so good, those things are going to bail me out, right, from my higher beta risk, like my equity risk or my commodity risk. Um, is that something you agree with um and and if not you know how how do you think about it do you, do you add vol to the portfolio do you add options to the portfolio well, how do you determine how much of that to do yeah i mean i think so if, if, if you just kind of take two ends of the spectrum right so you've got one end of the spectrum that there are many ways to invest there are many ways to generate returns and make money right so you take one end of the spectrum where you've got a setup and a framework that looks at the longer term and you've got so much conviction in your analysis of given companies or bonds or whatever and you've got a high level of conviction in the valuation or the price that you get into stuff where you like i don't really mind and, I'll, and I, i'm going to take the volatility because i um expect it and actually it is part of the roadmap and the path to delivering those really high levels of kind of annualized returns right so that's kind of one it's part of the appeal, right? It's like the reason you want the high vol, the high vol asset is because it will give you high returns, right? Well, I mean, I mean, yeah, like I'd phrase it, you know, a, a slightly different way. If you're going to invest in, you know, stocks that are going to give you a three x or five x over, um, so three times your money or five times your money in three mm. to five years, mm. you you you've got to be a bit crazy not to expect a 50, 40, 50% 50 drawdown on the ride. Like that's just part of, you know, that, that, that particular game. Yeah. Then you've got the other end of the spectrum where, you know, you want to just maximize your sharp ratio and you're just so sensitive to any kind of drawdown. Yeah. Um, so kind of what I'm going to discuss in, in a moment is that middle ground, right? We're trying to, we're trying to focus on that, on that medium term kind of strong, solid return 
we can take a bit of drawdown, um, but we don't want to really lose our shirts at any any at any given point. So within that frame, within that framework, think about it like this, or at least we think about it like this. You start out with a portfolio, ideally, of positions that you believe in that are actually robust to your central case and also robust to the other cases that you see. So no need for hedging because you've got just you know, the best implementations, they're going to generate you, they're all alpha return strategies, and you're going to have a, you know, a good, good, strong return potential. Now, sometimes that's not possible, many times it's not possible. So you want to introduce some level of robustness. And I would kind of start by thinking about an order of preference. So first, um, diversifiers than hedges. So diversifiers are trades or investments that potentially are low return in your central case. So wouldn't make it into your portfolio uh, on the basis of central case returns because many other returns or many other um, trades are out there that are better than that, but they have a good property where in one of your identified uh, non-core scenarios, adverse scenarios, they generate strong returns, right? So that's the second step. First step is let's try and make a portfolio of good investments that don't need hedging mm -hmm. or diversifying, then, okay, we can't find that. Let's think about a portfolio with diversifiers. Um, so in that, in that instance, your central case, the central scenario is not, you, you have no detract, detraction. But sometimes, so give me an example of a diversifier. Like the yeah, I mean, you know, again, like we don't have to get particularly sophisticated here, but the US dollar, right? You know, let's right. just take US dollar versus high beta G10. You know, there are points where the view on the US cycle versus the view on the, I don't know, the Australian or the Chinese cycle are such where you think that, you know, long dollar short Aussie is actually a decent proposition, decent in, um, trade to put on over a two to three month window because you, you expect the positive return. But the great thing about that particular investment or trade is it's got some nice, strong risk-off properties. Yeah. So in, in a scenario where your core portfolio, the adverse scenario is that risk-off, which is almost always the case, that strategy is a nice one to fit into the portfolio, yeah. positive return in your central case, but can help you out in that downside scenario, right? Yeah. Now, let's imagine that we've got the risk on portfolio, but we are anticipating a slowdown in the US. Um, so it's unclear as to whether long dollar strategies are gonna be good diversifiers. Mm -hmm. There are times like that where um, you, you know, where one can think actually this slowdown in the US or whatever shock it is, whatever adverse scenario is gonna impact my portfolio negatively. I don't wanna take that um, drawdown. So I'm gonna hedge. So in those instances, we've got, you know, I think it's a very simple framework that I kind of think about when you think about hedging is, if you're going to place a hedge, you've got to have something to hedge, as in your portfolio has got to be vulnerable to that scenario. It sounds basic, but, you know, you've got to get the right hedge for the portfolio. Otherwise, mm -hmm. that outcome happens and your hedge just doesn't work and you, it's, it's a bit of a nightmare. The worst thing in the world is having a hedge doesn't actually hedge you out in your... Exactly. Advantage. Yeah. All right. So, so, so one, let's get the hedge hedge, right. Secondly, um, let's, uh, have a good calibration on the probability of that scenario. Cause if it's like a 5% chance, generally in our industry, five to 10% chances we're, we're willing to take on without needing to hedge. So assess the probability of that thing you're worried about. Well, and then thirdly, um, value costs, what we just discussed, right? Pricing. Is it, yeah. Pricing. Like, is it, is it worth your while hedging? Are you actually going to generate the returns that you think you're going to generate? And a large part of that, or not a significant part of that, is getting in at the right price on your hedge. So if you can't find a hedge that meets those criteria, then you've got to think about paring down the risk in your core book. Like that's the kind of way that you, you know, want to think about. Thing. The last thing is yeah. I can't find a hedge that seems sensible given pricing. And, and, and probability of adverse outcome in your subjective probability, then yeah. maybe take your risk down. And actually that is your head going into cash, basically, or having, holding some more cash than you other, otherwise would, basically. But just, and, and, and just a point, a, a point on taking risk down. 
um, it's quite costly. Because like, if you think about, you know, let's, let's say that you know, you've got a portfolio that you're happy is going to compound 10% a year with all your, everything in it, all the strategies. To take risk down on that portfolio for any length of time, the opportunity cost is pretty high. So um, again, this is why it's so complex. This is why you know, investing and trading is so interesting. These are really you know, uh, interesting problems that you've got to deal with when you're managing um, portfolios and mm. thinking about hedging, yeah, and, and it's very different. I imagine it's very different to when you're running your own money, right? Like if I go too heavy into cash in my pension, I'm not going to have anyone knocking at my door going, why are you not making me any return on my money, right? You can't do that because you've got people giving you their money and the whole point is to put that money to work. So it's a very different... Now, I don't mind parking in cash if I'm a bit nervous, if I think the market smells a bit frothy or whatever. And okay, it's opp- agreed it's opportunity cost, but it's still I'm still preserving my wealth provided inflation isn't too crazy high, parking a bit in cash. It's not going to zero, it's not going down. But yeah, I think when you're running other people's money, those, those considerations are, and I think that cost of taking down the book is much greater, basically. Yeah. All right. Um, okay, cool, cool. It's super interesting stuff. Um, I mean, the, the, I suppose, you know, I've been quite big in crypto recently, right, for the last couple of years. So, so, you know, me and you, we had a few little conversations about this, but, you know, if I was still in the professional trading world, I probably would have had less time and then, you know, to focus on crypto and get my head around it. And a lot of the people who I know who still sit at banks in trading seats are like, yeah, no, I, I don't know. I still think crypto is a bit dodgy and I, I don't buy it and, and it's a Ponzi and all this, right? What about yourself? You, you're, you're running real money. You're running other people's money. There's been a load of institutional adoption in crypto this year. What's your take on crypto? Gold, go, or, or, and how would you compare it to an allocation to something like gold? Yeah, I mean, I would, I would <laughs> turn to you if it wasn't you asking me this question to get oh. the answer, right? But let's just kind of think through this a little bit. Um, there's, there's clearly something happening um, in the um, space of uh, crypto in the space of blockchain um, that is pretty revolutionary and it's going to impact what we do and what I do um, in fairly short order. I'm pretty sure on that. How it's going to impact, I'm not sure whether it's through the inf- infrastructure side or whether it's through the asset class side, as you kind of describe, and it, whether it's you know the dominance of some of these crypto uh, related assets that comes in and kind of crowds out some of the underperforming mainstream assets. Maybe that's a kind of pathway that is um, a potential outcome. So from my perspective, you know, I kind of look at um, the moves in um, um, some of the um, mega cap crypto um, 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 currencies, and I see quite strong correlations to risk assets. Um, Again, this is just a kind of pattern recognition. I've got it on my screen, I can see it. Uh, And that's interesting. Uh, I see correlations to um, enthusiasm to retail money. Um, so again, that, that factor has got to be within the mix, within the price kind of levels um, as to where we are, where mm-hmm. we're trading. And there's a good reason why retail uh, activity has picked up tremendously over the last 12 to 18 months. We know that there've been, you know, um, the handouts have been the spare time for people to get investing. There's mm-hmm. been the information dissemination, you know, the better information from guys like you, et cetera, that are getting people educated and kind of moving um, and feeling more confident with their own money. Mm-hmm. Um, so a question would be how, how persistent is that trend? Potentially that's going to be an underlying driver of, uh, of that kind of, you know, of, that, of, of, of the crypto space. But again, it's, it's difficult for, for, for me in my seat to kind of make, a judgment on where we think it's going to go, but I, but I do think that the influence of crypto and where it goes is starting to become important for mainstream asset classes, and mm-hmm. that's because the holders, some of the holders of crypto, are also the marginal price setter in the shorter what, term in 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 some of these other asset classes like equities. So what you're yeah, I mean, okay, so I would translate what you said to be. 
So like sentiment was one of the things that you like to keep an eye on. And whereas, you know, the level of the VIX is one barometer of sentiment, maybe that where crypto is trading is another barometer of some of that retail sentiment, some of that, you know, animal spirits, high spec confidence, basically, right? Um, and that, like I said, then that does feed through to the broader asset classes. So yeah, I think that even if you're not trading crypto, or you're not allowed to trade crypto, having it on your screen and, and seeing how it's behaving probably does add another piece to the puzzle, I guess. Right? Completely, completely agree, yeah. Okay, fair enough. Very, very diplomatic answer. I'll let, <laughs> I'll, I'll let you get away with that. Um, and then, okay, I guess the before we wrap up, we should talk a bit about outlook for next year, right? I mean, um, I, it seems to be, you know, really the Fed has now accepted that they got inflation wrong. Uh, they dropped the word transitory. And, and, and this inflation, deflation, or let's call it disinflation debate is, is, is raging. Um, where do you stand on that for next year? What, what, what do you think on inflation versus disinflation? Is it how persistent will it be? And, and, and what are the consequences? Yeah, um, I, I think that's a pretty key question for, for the next year or next couple of years. Um, in a nutshell, I think that inflation remains pretty firm in the shorter term. Um, and over a slightly longer term horizon, it's difficult to see why those forces that depressed inflation over the last 20 years, 25 years, are not going to kind of reassert themselves. So kind of just breaking that down a little bit, right? So drivers of inflation, wages, um, unit, unit labor costs, right? So it's actually the productivity adjusted wages that matter for, for as a key driver for inflation, labor mm. market tightness, um, supply chain disruption, all of this stuff looks like, you look at the trends in some of these data, um, they're not softening, right? And you look at some of the core components of inflation, um, like rents, for example, or core services, they're, they're, they're pretty firm. And there are reasons for that, clearly. So COVID, I think you can't answer that question without having a view on what's going on with respect to COVID globally, et cetera. So potentially, and again, we don't know enough just yet, Omicron has the possibility to turn what was a pandemic into an endemic situation by kind of getting uh, the virus into the pockets of the population, triggering those immunity updates ever so often, but in a way that's not particularly deadly. Mm. And if you get that situation, then you start to have some of these supply chain issues um, start to ease. Mm -hmm. Right. So then you, it's not just supply chain of goods, it's just supply of labor. Right. So I think about it from the US data perspective, for example, that um, there's a chunk of the population that not, that's not coming back because either they are worried about the virus or they've got other responsibilities that come from the virus impact that they just can't return, return to the workforce. If you've got a outlook i think which we do have from the second half of next year because you've got the antivirals also coming in with respect to covid and these are you know the ones that were made were manufactured by pfizer and Merck. pfizer's got an 89 percent efficacy on hospitalizations mm -hmm. you take it if you've got a moderate case i think two or three days after symptoms and your chances of hospitalization are cut significantly so you get all of this stuff coming through and you think that the impact of the pandemic starts to wane through the course of next year, you have to infer that the impact on inflation from pandemic trends starts to wane too, right? So mm -hmm. that's that's the kind of contour I've got. Now, what's the market impact? I think the market impact is trickier because what you could have is really firm inflation in the first quarter, first half of the year mm -hmm. that doesn't show any signs of slowing, which forces the Fed's hand which then you get that tightening of financial conditions. Mm -hmm. um, and as we just discussed, there's a little bit of speculative froth across many parts of financial markets. Mm -hmm. And as soon as you get that tightening, um, you start to, you know, it's always the case that there is something somewhere that breaks or there is some liquidity crunch that starts to kind of have some form of ripple effect. But mm -hmm. again, from this point here, it feels like that would be a buying opportunity. You get that sell off, that liquidity and you sell off, and then you kind of have inflation coming down. The Fed resets its course. 
mm. and you've got probably pretty strong kind of growth trends, you know, through the, through the, through the course of next year, but reassert themselves as the pandemic wanes. And that's a pretty good environment for risk assets. Mm. Yeah, I mean, it, I mean, obviously, with the fiscal drag, though, coming from like less fiscal support, basically, right? You, yeah. You've got to expect growth's going to be turning a bit lower as well, but not necessarily in a super dramatic way. But if the Fed is forced, if the Fed's hand is forced to go too quick, then that's not going to be great for growth as well, I guess, right? And I guess that's yeah. what the, the yield curve is kind of starting, trying to say, right? Every time we get hawkish, we get hawkish rhetoric and high inflation prints, the curve's flattening and not steepening. Like, what, what do you read into that curve flattening? Was that a case of being too hawkish too quickly is basically going to stifle growth? Is that, is that how you read that? Yeah, I mean... I've always looked at kind of govies and fixed in- core fixed income as being a bit of a spot asset class, right? So by that, I mean concerned about pretty short-term trends. And in the first quarter of next year, completely agree with what you said. You're going to have that sharp fiscal, negative fiscal impulse. Mm. You're going to have those inflationary trends. People are going to be talking about stagflation, again, if they're, if they're not already. Yeah. Um, you're going to have the Fed's boots. You're going to have the Fed thinking about risk management and inflation. Remember, the last 15 years have been risk management and inflation from the downside, right? And now it's yeah. only been the last two or three months where that notion is starting to change around a symmetric risk management of inflation. Um, mm. And a decade or a decade and a half of positioning and mindset, it doesn't change. Like, it doesn't flip in a month or two, right? So, like, I think it's going to be a difficult. Uh, first quarter, half of the year, for sure, and I think that's I think that's what you pointed to, right? And that's where the yield curve is probably um, reflecting that flattening. And then potentially one path that kind of goes through this is that the Fed the Fed hikes, um, we get this normalization in the pandemic, and people realize actually, you know, things are not falling to pieces. Like you know, economic growth is still strong, mm-hmm. and from that point, you want to be thinking about the steepness you want to be thinking about the financials the insurers yeah. uh you want to thinking about you know some of the riskier assets like emd and um you know those those ones that are kind of the mirror image the mirror opposite in terms of price performance in terms of stagflation you want to start to think about accumulating those you know through the first half of next year yeah interesting yeah no i, I agree i don't think the world necessarily does fall apart it's just that We've had quite staggering equity market performance, right? If you look at it over the last two, three years. And so some, you know, we might have quite a volatile 2022 and still end up up 10% across global equities, but that path might be quite choppy, right? Yeah, yeah completely. And, and like, that's where I think you got to have that um, awareness, like risk awareness, right? So we kind of think about risk awareness as, um, knowing the risks your portfolio is exposed to and thinking probabilistically. And if you're going to have those twists and turns, like you're going to have you know, frameworks like Darius is you know, at, 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 at his shop, kind of helping you through those twists and turns, but you still got to have your wits about you and think about the probabilities, think about the distributions, make the investment decisions when the odds are in your favor, when you've got multiple um, drivers and the odds are in your favor, Mm-hmm. that's the way you're going to navigate those twists and turns. Mm-hmm. It's really difficult to call the top and the bottom and to yeah. sell high, buy low, sell high, buy low. But what you can do is make those good, you know, as I just said, those good assessments of the distributions and you get more of the uh, investments and trades right than wrong at all mm-hmm. parts of that kind of cycle. And you, you end up a year where you've got, you know, a strong cumulative performance. Yeah, yeah it makes a lot of sense. All right, man. I think, yeah. uh, I think we call it a day. Uh, I won't keep you, uh, you know, appreciate your time. I won't keep you any longer. It's been a pleasure. Yeah. Uh, it's we great have to, to have do this again. On, yeah, yeah, really good to have you on and uh, good luck for next year. I'm sure you'll, sure you'll smash it as always. Uh, and uh, take care. I hope everyone enjoyed the conversation and uh, we'll see you next time. Thanks for joining Cheers. us today. I hope you enjoyed the episode. To learn more about Options Insight and our trading community, please visit us at www.options-insight.com or you can subscribe to our YouTube channel, 
And also follow us on Twitter at options underscore insight. Until next time, thanks. Thank you.